page 186. 186. Jitterbug perfume, right where we left off. <clears throat> to Alabar's mind, there were several possibilities, reasons why Kudra hadn't rematerialized. To wit, one, once she had fallen over the edge, Alabar was assuming that her experience paralleled his own. She had just kept falling, growing lighter, looser, and larger until the, she became nothing, or everything, and was therefore, in a rather grotesque way, dead, or at least irretrievable. Once, oh wait, I remember that. In the world of the non-living, she had been reunited with her parents. This was the other option. With Navian, the rope maker, and with her abandoned children about whom she felt Alabar knew continued remorse. Alabar sincerely blamed himself, so no 17th century male would publicly admit to such a shortcoming for Kudra's failure to convince, to conceive, oh, convince, conceive in their recent efforts. But of course, the fault lay with the penny royal that she had ingested for over seven years years, and which had left a contraceptive residue that would bash sperm in the head for a long time to come. In that case, she would choose not to rematerialize for a while, if ever. 3. She had landed safely on the other side and was searching there for him, since she had no way of knowing that this dematerialization had been aborted. Perhaps she feared that he was lost. Hmm. Or four, she had landed on the other side and become lost there herself. Maybe she longed to come back, but couldn't find her way. Or number five, since their practical objective in learning to dematerialize was to transport themselves across the Atlantic, it could be that Kudra had crossed directly and was waiting for Pan and him to join her in the new world. Hmm. In the event that it was reason number one that detained her, there was nothing Alabar could do but grieve. If it was number two, he could only carry a torch, as they say, and hope that his love would eventually draw her back to him. To deal with possibly three or four might or might not require him to dematerialize. But in either case, he instinctively felt that their long-sought perfume would be the key to their finding one another again. For that matter, if it was the number five, that was correct. If she had taken advantage of a free and easy passage to the new world and was con counting on Pan and him to follow her, the perfume would also be necessary, both as a mask for goat gas and as a signal in case their seeing one another directly was prevented by natural or supernatural obstructions. Well, at least he could provide that perfume now, or could he? That question, and a sack of beaker tubes, cucible, instructional strength candles, citron, jasmine oil, and a five-ounce bottle with pan on the side weighed him down on the long trek to Bohemia. The beet harvest was right on schedule. Towards the tail of July, peasants were in the fields from morning until night, ripping whiskered fetuses from the planetary mud. A steady parade of ox carts <laughs> would wound towards the villages, bearing baskets of smokeless coals and sacks of idle eyes. Concealed on a hillside thicket, Alabar kept one eye on the harvest, one on the road to the west, down which he expected to, at any moment, see a hashish-colored woman jiggling and swaying, jumping beans and aspic 
a satin ship rolling in a tide of licorice sauce. The harvest petered out. The woman never appeared, but the bohemian farmer or farmers, as they had done since Alabar could remember, left a few acres of beets undug so that they might complete their cycle and provide the seed for next year's crop. But there was a patch of seed beets here, a patch there, after miles apart. Alabar mapped the countryside, exiting the fields where the treasure lay. He didn't have bothered by mid-August. His nose could have, his nose could have led him blindfolded to the places where the pollen was congregating. In the dark of night, Alabar and Pan collected the vicious powder from the plant tops, filling beakers that they stashed in the particularly dense thicket. Twigs and branches jabbed at their eyes out. Briars tore Pan's flesh and Alabar's clothing, but each dawn they kicked and shoved their way into the coppice where they added another couple of beakers to the stash and lay down to sleep in a chaos of sweating vines, mucus leaves, and m maggoty logs. Mistletoe dripped an unsavory liquid on them. A living confetti of spiders and earwigs dotted them from head to heel. Curds of mushrooms and scrumbles of lichen soiled them to the bone. But Pan slept as if he were to that foul manner born. And Alabar was too desperate to care. His fitful dream were all of Kudra, and when he lay awake in the rot and tangle, he sniffed at the contrasting clouds of musk that billowed from the god and the beakers of beet pollen, nodding with immense satisfaction that they nearly canceled one another out. After a dozen containers had been filled, they hiked into the high hills where smoke would not be noticed. And while Pan lay on the hummus noodling his pipes, Alabar had fetched them in his sack, and they put the local fauna into a tizzy. Alabar constructed a crude laboratory. He boiled down the beet pollen into an extract gray, gooey, and possessed of basto profundo. That could have brought the rafters down in the grand opera of smell. When all the extracts had been made, Alabar shook the wood lice out of his breeches, washed his face in a creek, and set out for a large town on the Russian border, where he knew a vodka master to reside. Pan was left behind to guard the equipment. Without the feel feeble god to slow him, Alabar reached the, <laughs> the feeble god. Alabar reached the town in a week. There he approached the vodka maker, who, in return for the last of Alabar's French gold pieces, agreed to distill the beet pollen extract, an operation that, to Alabar's displeasure, consumed the better part of a month. The job at last complete, Alabar tied a gallon jug of distillate to each end of a stout pole rested the pole across both shoulders and left the town at a trot. Were it not for the preciousness and weight of his cargo, he might have left a gallop. He was anxious about Kudra. Who could have returned in his absence anxious about Pan? Who could have strayed? Inasmuch as his health would permit, Pan had cooperated in the venture to disguise his maldor and transport him to the new world. But he hardly could be rated enthusiastic. He was in fact so no nonverbal, so distinct, so distracted, solitary, and even in his invisibility, especially in his invisibility, charged with psychic shock that nothing he might have done could really have surprised Alabar, who had little choice but to withhold trust. Stopping neither to eat nor sleep, his brain hot with imagined disasters, the man who once was a king in this land flapped through the countryside in his filthy rags, his boots falling away from his feet, his latest beard flying in the wind like a nauseated Chinaman losing his bird's nest soup. Their camp proved blessedly intact. 
Japan, present, and accounted for, molesting a confused doe he had attracted by his piping. As the poor deer sprang into the bushes, Alibar lifted the pole from his raw shoulders. "'Tis done,' he said, and lay down in the lean to fall, falling immediately into a wife-infested slumber. Twelve hours later, he woke and set at once to mixing the beet pollen distillate with the jasmine oil and citron essence in varying proportions. After five days of experimenting, he hit upon what seemed the ideal mixture— one part beet to twenty parts jasmine to two parts citron, a ratio that inspired him to name the scent K23. The K was for Kudra. Like a lobster with a pearl in its claw, the beet held the jasmine firmly without crushing or obscuring it. Beet lifted jasmine the way a bull-necked partner lift a ballerina. And the pair came on stage on Citron's fluty cue, as if Jasmine were a collection of beautiful paintings. Beat hung in, hung it in the galleries of the nose, insured <laughs> it against fire or theft. Insured it against fire or theft. Nice, that's very nice. Threw a party to celebrate it. Okay. Citron mailed the invitations. Oh, I see. I'm going to rewind that. As if Jasmine were a collection of beautiful paintings, Beat hung it in the galleries of the nose, insured it against fire and theft, threw a party to celebrate it. Citron mailed the invitations. Uh, the delivery. If Alabar could trust his nose, K-23 stopped Pan in its tracks. It seemed to throw a mantle gossamer in places, heavily embroidered, wait, embroidered in others over his funk, and however long and hard the goat musk might squirm beneath that cloak, it could not wriggle free. I wonder if I'm only imagining that it is so effective, worried Alabar. Perhaps it's wishful thinking or wishful smelling. There was nothing to be Nothing to submit it to objective testing. Oh. In a sack, Alibar packed a gallon jug of K-23. What remained of the beet pollen distillate, the jasmine and citron were used up. The empty bottle that Kudra had designed some roasted beets to munch on on the road and his companion's innocent-looking weeds. Then, at Pan's place, Pace, out there in the backcountry, the peasants still secretly honored him a fact that put a toad of pep, a tad of pep, in his step. They set off in the direction of France. In every village through which they passed, Pan freshly sprinkled with K-23 walked ahead, Alibar following at a distance of nine or ten yards. Directed by Alibar, Pan endeavored to brush a closely, as closely as possible to people in the street. From Bohemia to Paris, the results were invariably the same. As the invisible pan walked by, people's eyebrows would raise, their noses would tilt, and they would begin to run towards their, no their source of the scent, looks of expectation or ill-concealed delight forming on their faces. Halfway into the their turns, however, that expression would be abruptly dislodged by a twitch of embarrassment and re re-denying slightly the person would turn away as if to look directly at the origin of such fragrance might violate an intimacy sacred even to an unrefined yokel be amused smiles and involuntary pairing their lips they would continue on their way for a few yards when at a safe distance and no longer able to resist, they would stop and slowly look back, smiling all the while, only to find that the emanator of the aroma had, so they believed, turned a corner or disappeared through a doorway. <laughs> 
Off they would go. Off they would go. Not really disappointed. Some fantasy or other, obviously, drawing the grass blade lightly up along the genitals of the mind. The genitals of the mind. <laughs> now Alabar was hardly expert, but he realized that he had conceded a unique and genuinely amazing perfume. Oh, concocted. He concocted a fine perfume. A fragrance whose possibilities extended far beyond its worth. Praise the morning star for that worth as a cover-up for the horned one's fetus ooze. Kudra had predicted it. Had she not? She had said at least that she wished the perfume for Alabar and her as much as for Pan. On the outskirts of Paris, where they had rested beneath a stone bridge, waiting for darkness beneath, daring to enter the city, Alabar filled the bluish bottle to the brim with K-23. He put its stopper in. He pressed it to his tear-wet cheeks. It was late September there, with tambourines of frost in the air. Alabar and Pan crossed the gray city, their breath always one step ahead of them. Man's breath and God's breath looked identical, congealed in the urban night. The footsteps, on the other hand, were distinctly different. The bum flap of Alabar's boots, the blacksmith chisel of Pan's hooves. But they led to the same destination over the rigid effervescence of cobblestones. The incense, the incense shop was just as they had left it, boarded up and blocked by a crude wooden cross. Apparently the monks were giving it a wide berth. Had Alabar stopped off at the neighboring brewery perfumery, he would have caught the abbots discussing the sale of the business to an enterprising fragrance broker named Guy Lefebvre. At that very moment, Guy Lefevre, 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 was inquiring about the possibility of locating the owner of the incense shop and purchasing wait the owner of the incense shop and purchasing it as well, for he had heard that its inventory was quite valuable, and in disgust, oh, in disuse. But the abbot, who was sleeping better those nights and taking no chances, wrung his lily hands and cried, No, no, do not pursue it. <laughs> as deftly as possible, Alabar pried open a rear window, and him and Pan crawled in. Alabar's, Alabar's heart poured, beating more loudly than Pan's hoofbeats. As they climbed the stairs, the door to the sitting room was open with the crack. A creak. I'm having trouble reading it. Alabar did not recall that it had ever creaked before. Hmm. It seems that there should have been a harvest moon that night, but not a cuff link of moonlight was in evidence. Perhaps the moon was spending the evening at Versailles. In any case, Alabar did not really require a moon to see that nothing in the room had changed. The pale reach of a street lamp was sufficient to illuminate the sad taboo. His note, the single shoe, the balls of dust. He avoided going outside. <laughs> <clears throat> but rather leaned across the threshold just far enough to set down the bottle of K-23. Having first removed its stopper, he shut the door briskly as if the breeze from the door might speed a waft of perfume towards the other side. Upon the bed where he, where he, a latecomer to kissing, had kissed so much of her, he lay that night, weeping, dozing, waking to weep once more. Throughout the morning he lay there, a pillow which he imagined to bear some scent of her ebony hair, pasted to his face. He was past noon when he finally released himself from the twist of marriage-stained sheets. Lint in his beard, burrs of salt in the corners of his eyes, he patted barefoot 
barefoot to the sitting room to fetch the bottle. Pan was up and would be needing a fix. As bait, K-23 had failed. For the first time being at any rate, Alibar had heard no sound from the sitting room during the night. And now, creaking open the door, he saw that his note still lay there beneath the forlorn shoe. But wait, hadn't he tucked the note inside the shoe? And hadn't the shoe been placed in the very center of the carpet? Whereas it is now lay somewhat off to the right, close to the fireplace. Shaking like a wedding announcement in a mis... Well, mesomagamist fist? Alibar examined the shoe, unfolded, and reread the note. He turned them over and over. He even sniffed them. There were no marks, no odors, nothing unusually in any way. He had been moved. He was positive of that. It had been moved. The shoe had been moved. The question was, had they been moved during the night? In which case, the perfume was a lure. After all, or something during the preceding five months. Oh, yeah. The light had been so dim, his emotion so swollen on the previous evening, that he easily could have overlooked such a sight though significant displacement. Unable to learn anything from the slipper or paper, he scrutinized the room itself, patrolling the carpet, inch by dusty inch. Nothing. The walls, too, were as tabula rasa. Tabula rasa. Am I saying that right? When his gaze settled on the fireplace, however, his spine was straightened by a fulminous jolt. What, did he have the thesaurus out? For this <laughs> Jesus. Ful fulminous jolt. On the mantelpiece next to Kudra's beloved silver teapot, a word had been written in the dust. Yes, someone using a fingertip as implement had plowed a graffito on the surface of the marble. Where the dust lay thick as fur, the script, while instantly familiar, was not Kudra's style. However, nor was the word in her single written language. When Kudra had finally become literate, it was French that she had learned to read and write. The word on the mantelpiece was from the Salvo Nordic tongue that his clan had used to speak of battles, bear hunts, beet harvests, and broken mirrors. And the handwriting was that of the only woman in his kingdom with the ability to write that language. Wren. For a long time, Alabar just stood there, grasping the mantle's ledge for support. So shocked was he by the implications of language, that penmanship that he didn't even consider content. When at last he turned his attention to it, his bafflement only increased. The word was a transitive verb, an exclamation, a command of which an exact English translation is possible. The closest equivalent probably would be the phrase, lighten up. All right, I'm going to end right there. and We're on page 192. I'll finish. We'll read some more tomorrow, hopefully, if I remember. 192. Just put a little marker right there. Reading, reading uh, Jitterbug Perfume right there. If you'd like to hear the rest of it, you can hear me reading the first half on YouTube. I'm on YouTube channel right there. Wait, that's not it. Is that my YouTube? No, that's not my YouTube channel. Hey, where's my YouTube channel? That's right there, Michael. Michael V. Art. Oh, that's your YouTube channel? Nice. Yeah, if you want to hear a bunch of stuff, music, and all kinds of stuff about art and podcasts and blah, 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 go over there and subscribe. And you can hear the rest of this book, too. Sweet. Maybe I will. 
I'm over on Twitch right now, though, if you want to come hang out on Twitch.